Hello everyone, it's the Two Minute Terminator. We're back! It's episode 15 and we're going to break down the Terminator films two minutes at a time. Yes, that disembodied voice on the other end of the line, of course, is Ellie Fitzgerald, who's just had a liaison dangereux, I understand. How was that for you, Ellie? I just what? Had a liaison dangereux. Oh, it was marvellous. You just had I sex. Scratch, I've been to for like the last month. Well, I'm glad. And uh, that brings us neatly into uh, today's bumper music, which is Lalo Schifrin's uh, amazing score for THX, oh, nice. THX 1138, which is very evocative, I think, of Close Encounters meets uh, The Abyss, two of Ellie's favourite films, no less. I do love both of those films. So, yeah, we break down the Terminator films two minutes at a time. We're going from the 28-minute mark to the 30-minute mark. Uh, the scene opens with what, Ellie? With his charm. In the resistance camp. <laughs> and? Uh, and it ends with... Sorry, the music. It's kind of like the same scene, really. They're just kind of having a chat about... I haven't been able to write any notes on this episode. Ethan's like, we'll just talk about it. So. Well, you, shouldn't have, you should have been prepping for the show instead of having sex. Anyway, yeah. I'm Ethan McKinley. She's Ellie Fitzgerald. This yeah. is the two-minute Terminator. I will get to that. Shut up. <laughs> Howdy, stranger. Don't say howdy, stranger, to me. You didn't do the fourth. Thank God. <laughs> it sucked. <laughs> and we're back. Uh, yes, the minutes do, in fact, start with Sam Worthington... Uh, you know, using his charm and disarming uh, a young uh, Carl Reese, played by Anton Yelchin, who uh, triumphantly portrayed uh, Chekhov in the new Star Trek films. And it ends with Christian Bale lisping through his teeth and looking surlily into the camera, even though I probably think he's looking through the camera upset at McGee, the director, who he doesn't like at all. I, I don't know. I think McGee is unfairly lambasted with this kind of like Brett Ratner kind of shitty, <laughs> you lambasted. Uh, uh, yeah, I think he's unfairly tarnished with this kind of like brush that Brett Ratner gets as well. This very he's a workman like director of some music videos. I think back in the day, and I think David Fincher was probably one of the last people to sneak through as a respected director that started in music videos, uh, because the likes of Marcus Nispel, who did uh, the Texas Chainsaw remake, which is pretty good, and he did the, did the Conan remake, even though the film's a bit patchy. They got the feel, I think, better than, of the Robert E. Howard kind of books feeling than i guess the movies did but obviously the guy that played conan which was uh jace momoa that sexy motherfucker from uh game of thrones looked more like the i guess the comic book or the book version of conan versus arnold but arnold obviously has uh the charisma to burn and the giant muscles so original original conan is still the best yeah. Ah. but yeah no i i, th I really need to see red oh you should i think it's uh the unofficial third sequel, really, to uh, Conan. It's better than Conan 2. It's a really good film. I love Red Sonja. Really great movie. Lots of fun. Uh, but no, I think McGee kind of gets shit on a lot by people. And a bit like Brett Ratner, who I think is actually really good. Brett Ratner did the Rush Hour movies. He did X-Men 3. Sorry, it's actually pretty good, everyone. It's better than X-Men 1. Think about it. The, the, climactic, <laughs> the climactic battle of X-Men 1 happens in a gift shop. Come on. A gift shop. Yeah, no, it, I don't know. Everyone kind of shits on McGee. I just think he's one of those guys who's out there kicking it. He does, like, decent work. He just never got his break. This would have been his break, but it all just fell apart. I think the box office was harmed again by Christian Bale ranting at that dude on set. So Bale's really, I think, more to blame for the failure of the film than actually even McGee. Yeah. This is more Well, they've tried to go for a new look. I think it's a bit of a failure in that sense. But uh, at least they tried to do something different. But anyway, on with the, on with the, uh, the clips. So, yeah, starts with Sam Worthington disarming uh, young Carl Reese and uh, teaching him how to kind of hold a gun. It's not a euphemism. Shut up, Ellie. Uh, <laughs> and it ends with uh, John Connor staring into the camera as he's uh, giving his kind of uh, Captain S, Captain's Log, Captain Kirk style. So, Ellie, what have you gleaned from this? 
It's it's Lalo Schifrin's wacky, amazing score to THX 1138. Uh, THX 1138 was a student film made at USC by a very young George Lucas. That obviously ca he caught the attention of a young Francis Ford Coppola, who was an established kind of director at that point, because Francis had made The Godfather I think, one, and I think he'd done Godfather Part Two at that point. So he kind of liked George's work and took him under his wing. Uh, I think George was at then, of course, I considered the best director of that year. He did lots of like really cool. Uh, experimental films. His final year piece, of course, was the student version of THX 1138. It was so kind of lauded, uh, Francis Ford Coppola kind of uh, took him under his wing with American Zoe Trope and they remade the film on a bigger budget called again to uh, THX 1138 with Robert Duvall. Not, not to tinker George Lucas, redid it again, I think around 2000 or 1999. He kind of like added more special effects and made it improve the image and things. It's not that offensive, really, the changes he made. But it's a pretty good film. It's like a future shock film. The best thing about it, which will bring us back to Terminator, is uh, if you Google any of... Well, no, if you, shut up. If you... Uh, the, the evil robots that kind of enforce the law in this dystopian Orwellian future that everyone is kind of trapped in, they're all policemen in police motorcycle outfits with the motorcycle helmet, and they've got silver-like liquid metal faces. So, so there, I think, is where Cameron got his uh, idea for the T-1000. It looks exactly like the T-1000, like the face of it, just this, like, metal face and then this kind of motorcycle helmet and the policeman outfits. Done on a budget, of course, but it's such a striking image. What were the names of the terrifying robots that were in, um, oh, God, the Avengers, the original Avengers movies? Oh, God, what were I don't know. I don't know much about the Avengers, Ellie. I know uh, John Steed. I love the the theme John tunes. Amazing. Oh, no, that's the name of the character, not the actual name of the guy. Anyway, there were these really terrifying robots in the Avengers, and they had these just kind of plain silver faces, and they'd always be wearing these kind of trilby hats and these long coats, and they had these like metal hands. It was kind of interesting to us. Well, if you check your Viber images now, Ellie, I've just sent you t a picture of the uh, the robotic policeman that enforced the iron will of the uh, Orwellian future, I guess. In, uh... I would love to check that. However, if I do, it will cut out the signal and I won't be able to speak anymore. Well, that will... C that Can you not see the thumbnails I've sent you? Oh, well, that's a bugger. Well, look at them after, but like, it's a, they're, quite, they're very good. I, and considering the tiny budget George had, I think the image of these police is... Basically, yeah. But no, the image of these kind of like robotic, faceless, emotionless policemen uh, which is such a, like a cool image. And I'm quite sure this is where Cameron got his idea for the T-1000 from. I think something without a face. That's why I think the alien works so well. This kind of like faceless thing. It's Yeah. I think it's, it's very like uh, a striking image. But uh, we digress, even though we are kind of talking about Terminator. Uh, we don't, but I'll look it up as you're stalking. Stalking. Um, <laughs> uh, what, what we've gathered is that uh, this, these two, these two young children are actually the resistance. So does that mean that there is nobody else? Is this how the resistance started? Well, no. In this film, as we discussed, the resistance is already up and running. They're a few years into their assault, and that I'm assuming, just to be an apologist and kind of retrofit the look or the excuse for the look of this film that they're using machine guns and like regular weaponry they've not infiltrated deep enough or i guess broken into any of those here we go they've infiltrated deep enough into those underground labs i guess that's one of the first ones they've discovered which is a couple of scenes back where marcus Wright actually is kind of born essentially yeah. uh so I guess that's when they pick up more of the Terminator weapons that shoot plasma and stuff and etc. And that's when you get into the Cameron future, which is about another 10 years from now. So what's Carl talking about then? What do you mean? Because Marcus goes, because he's just like, you know, what is this place? And he's just like, this is like the base camp for the resistance. And he's just like, what are you two? And he goes, yeah, that's us. So what's he talking about then? Has everyone left this area? 
Yeah, I guess. But I, I suppose, which is what Kyle says, the Michael Bean version of the character when he's explaining about the future, there's just little pockets of people just living off rats and what they can. There's no unification. But again, the flip... The flip. However, yeah, there's another kind of giant fighting force fighting the machines. So I guess, I mean, it makes sense. You wouldn't have everyone bundled together. You'd have people dotted around everywhere. That's why you've got those, like, human, like... Well, yeah, I mean, Newt, in, to go back to Cameron again, Newt's kind of alone, and she's uh, a little girl in Aliens. Yes, yes, she is. <laughs> Shut up. She's a little girl in, in, in Aliens. Um, one thing I would like to say as well about this uh, particular two minutes, although it's actually at the very end of the last two minutes, it's something I forgot to mention. You know how I was saying I didn't think it was very realistic that they were eating coyotes and I didn't think that those kind of things would have survived and what? No, they wouldn't. Yeah. Would a, would a fern tree air freshener have made it? Because at the very end of the last two minutes that we did on episode 50, uh, 40, you see like the silhouette of one of those like... Um, Magic trees. trees. Yeah, I'm not sure if it'd actually be working as an air freshener anymore, but uh, yeah, they'd have magic trees. There'd be loads of like yeah, products just. It would blow up the magic trees factory. There'd be no more air fresheners. This is a dystopian future. No nice air. Well, it would have, Ellie, but there'll be still, like, relic reliquary items of, like, the previous civilization dotted around. You're only, like... By the way, I, I please forgive the peppy uh, elevator music we're playing. This is still the THX soundtrack. Of course it is. This sounds like walking down the beach in some 70s heart-to-heart -heart TV show in a calf town with your willy flapping about. <laughs> Did you just say willy? Yeah. Uh, the little black actress in uh, 10 Minutes of Salvation is a girl called Jada Grace. Ah, has she been anything else? Yeah, she was in a film in 2008 called Three Verses, which was a short. Then she had a big break as Star. That's the character's name. Jada, Bra Jada Grace Berry is her full name. Mm -hmm. And uh, nothing happened for three years. In 2012, she had the Jada Grace show. Oh, God. Where she stars as herself. Basically, a multi-talented 11-year-old, Jada Grace, uh, uploads a homemade music video of herself on the internet, which quickly goes viral. Her amazing talent comes to the attention of Hollywood music producers. How exciting. Did you come up with this, your idea? Did you come up with this idea? Basically, yeah, it's like Hannah Montana. Did you, Jada, did you come up with this idea on your own? Yes. So it's just about you being, like, talented and amazing and singing. Yeah. Okay. Kid, I'm going to make you a star. <laughs> Can I just say... No. Um, I actually think the Jada Grace show is a bit of a shame. Yeah, it's not a shame. 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 Alpha Dog. This, um, this kid gets, um, it's called Alpha Dog, Ellie. Have you seen it? No. Oh, you should watch it. So the young kid that gets um, abducted is the, is the guy that plays Carl Reese. He gets taken to a house party. He then meets Amber Heard and this other chick who I, her name evades me. 
And they're just like, how old are you? And he's like, 15. And they're like, have you ever had sex before? And he's like, no. They take him to the fucking swimming pool. They go get butt naked. And he's all fucking in the pool. They get butters, do they? Butters. You see how butter is bosoms. Wow. Um, well, one of them. <laughs> and, uh, yeah, the next minute, they take him off into the desert. And they fucking kill him. Dude, his acting was so fucking good. I was so... Considering I hadn't seen it from start to finish... I was so entranced. I was so upset when what happened happened. I just couldn't believe it. And then I was like, Kyle! <laughs> yeah, Spider Man! And of course, um, it wasn't even Spider Man. No. No, the new. the, the Well, Anton Yelchin is, I think, 26 or 27 now. Uh. Spider-Man, the new Spider-Man, the one we saw in Civil War about a month or so ago, uh, was, oh God, what's his name? Tom Holland, who's a British actor from that film, uh, is it The Miracle or The Something? The one where that woman gets her boob ripped off? I don't know, but I haven't seen that. She gets her titty ripped off. It's That's about amazing. it's about the tsunami and her family being trapped in the in the storm. And in the middle of it is uh, Hugh McGregor and Naomi Watts, and she gets her titty ripped off. Hua. Hi Hiya. Oh boy, do I. Uh, right, but. Uh, yeah, if you want. <laughs> that was like a very impotent mew. Shut up. Uh, yeah, basically, in one scene, we see Marcus snatching the shotgun from Kyle, played by your favourite actor, Anton Yelchin. Uh, in Terminator 2 Judgment Day, uh, the T-800 grabs a shotgun from the bar owner in the exact same way. So it's a nod to Terminator 2. Yeah. It's when the guy goes, you can't take the mic from him. You can't take the man's bike, son. Well, he also... up to him and then flips the... Uh, and takes his glasses. Yeah. Well, he also teaches him to kind of put the strap behind your arm. But all that would happen if someone just grabbed the gun then, you'd just get yanked towards them. Exactly. So I don't know what that is in actually service of, that help. Yeah. I mean, it's a good, I mean, I learned it as a photographer that you always put the strap and wrap it twice around your arm. So if you drop it, or, yeah, strap and wrap. Never double strap, though. If you've seen 20 on Drum Street, you'll understand that. Anyway, the shot, I'm, I'm not finished yet. Uh, the shotgun uh, Kyle initially has is taken away from him by Marcus. It's a Mooseberg, here you go, Spawner, a Mooseberg 500. Uh, typically used by uh, for door breaching. So when the, uh, I guess, the SWAT teams, they shoot the... Uh, they do it in Captain America Civil War. They shoot the uh, door stops. What is it? The hinges, sorry, off a door. Uh, the standoff muzzle devices uh, set breaching shotguns apart from the rest. Uh, and this is a giveaway feature. So it's basically got a breaching silencer thing on the end of the gun. It's called a, it's called a standoff muzzle. Uh, well, okay, Ellie. Uh, the trick to keeping a shotgun attached around the arm that Marcus shows Carl Reese is used by the older Carl Reese, played by Michael Bean, at the beginning of the original Terminator. After he saws it off the bu after he saws off the butt and shortens the shotgun that he stole from the police squad car. Is that really a nod, though? I think that's just him being practical and keeping it under his jacket. I'm sorry, everything is a sexual innuendo tonight. Well, a bit of tw a bit of twine versus an actual strap for a shotgun. I don't know. A bit of twine. Yeah. What do I know? I really like the bit when uh, he's... I kind of went into my own little dream world. And uh, when he takes the gun off him and then he puts his hand up like that, I was really hoping he was just going to go wing up <laughs> Go what? Wing up <laughs> <laughs> It's a little pastiche for Disney. Uh, <laughs> Ellie, take the show. <laughs> I'm just going to tell everyone, by the way, we've not prepared for this show at all. We've done this kind of quickly because you're going to go out now, I think. And uh, we've, I've just kind of stopped you and we need to do a show. It's Thursday. And you've got one tomorrow as well, Ellie. Don't forget. <laughs> I know, but, this, but tomorrow's one I'll actually have notes on. I'll be prepared for. Now, there is going to be a, maybe a gap in the shows for the next few days because if I can't get off enough over the weekend, relax, Ellie. Don't, it's not in your end. If I can't get off enough shows recorded, pre-recorded by the weekend, I'm working until next Thursday, so we might have to drop out. Well, no, it's not all right for me because we did this last week to cover me for the week because I had podcasts and shows and work to do, Ellie. I kind of pre-recorded the week's shows, didn't I, on the Sunday. 
and then worked all through Sunday night. Literally. Literally. And yet you wanted to do it. I did. I still do. This show is just a big cock up, Ellie. Would you like a cock up? In the original film, Kyle Reese says that he couldn't identify the Terminator until it attacked Sarah Connor, as the T-800 model uh, looks human. However, as shown in the climax of this film, he has previously seen a T-101 Arnie model uh, Terminator and should have recognized him on site. He should have, but to let the f film off the hook, it's an alternate timeline, isn't it, like the new Star Trek films? Exactly. Started by Terminator 3, the greatest film ever made. Are you actually? Now, I said this all through T3, T3, and you never, you were like, rubbish, blah, 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 blah. Do you know what, though? I, um, even though it's Terminator, watching it the second time, I am seeing it almost as like a film in its, well, it is a film in itself, but I don't know. It doesn't feel kind of attached to the other films. It's just doing its own thing. No. But it just didn't. No, because the feel is all Cameron, isn't it? Feel me, Cameron. If James Cameron came back and did another, did another Terminator without Arnold, I think he could still make it work. Oh, yeah, so do I. Robert Patrick in the second one is scarier than Arnold has been in any of the films, including the first one. Yeah, he's terrifying. He was great. He's got a weird... Th he's, I don't know, the, the T-1000 still gives me the heebie-jeebies. He's got like this feel of the thing about it as well. It's just that unstoppable thing. That's what I liked about it. I was just like, oh, right up until the end. Yeah, well, you know why that is, though, don't you? Anyone. Just anyone. And who was gonna who was gonna play this every man looking unassuming Terminator in the original before Arnold came aboard? Uh, it was going to be God, what's his bloody name? He's the cop that works in the police station. He's also Volkovich. Aliens. That's it. Bishop. Bishop, there we go. That was meant to be is that who was meant to be the Lance Henriksen, Ellie, Lance Henriksen. Lance well, it was gonna. It was the idea was Lance Henriksen initially because Cameron had worked with him on Piranha Two, and they James Cameron is kind of up to a certain point, a bit like Jeanette Goldstein was uh, James Cameron's good luck charm. They always appear in his films, hither or thither. Having said that, now we've got to. Having said that, uh, now we've got to Avatar. Both Lance Henriksen and Jeanette Goldstein weren't in them, so I don't know why, because they think it would have been cool to have Lance Henriksen in there. Hmm. Maybe I don't know. Maybe it was timing. I, I I find it odd that he wasn't in it. I mean, he was going to survive and actually have a cameo in uh, Terminator Three, wasn't he? If you remember. What was his cameo going to be? Well, because I think he doesn't. Does he get killed? Oh, I I know what. Sorry, I'm. I take it back. He was going to be in. They were meant to be in Terminator Genesis. The J.K. Simmons role, who was that cop who was there in the police station that night of the shootout and always remembered it 30 years later and is now this kind of like private detective and is still looks into this case every now and again. That was meant to be uh, Lance Henriksen. He was meant to have survived that night and this, this kind of thing would have been stuck in his head the whole time. I need to solve the mystery of who this man was that shot at the police station that night and disappeared and then reappeared in 1991 and like had that fight in the shopping mall. That was meant to be Lance Henriksen in Terminator Genesis. Ah, uh, do you reckon that would have been good? Yeah. He's about the Well, Lance Henriksen's about 70. I think J.K. Simmons is in his late 50s or around 60 now. But no, they could have made that work. And it would have nicely tied it back into the other Terminator films, at least one and two anyway. Yeah, it would have, yeah. Oh, maybe you're right. I'm always right, Ellie. What about when your dad left? <laughs> what about when your dad left? Both times. <laughs> <laughs> Mew. The second time will 
to me left and he died, so. Uh. <laughs> We pushed him into a smelting pit, like the T-1000. Well, I to help Finn and, uh, I know. I know you'd kill for me, Ellie. I know we've got that Myra Hindley and Brady thing going on. I might... Oh, Fred West and Rose West. Yeah, no, the Myra Hindley and... Um... I could talk you into anything. I talked you into a podcast. You talked me into doing this podcast, so... <laughs> so got the real power here. Who knows? Terminator Salvation, come on. News. Uh, have you got... I've got nothing either. I've got nothing left to give. But no, that's uh, that was a good episode. We had some nice information there. Thank you all for listening, everyone. We shall return again tomorrow. tomorrow. Then if the worst comes to the worst, you might get one or two in the week and then nothing until Friday. The reason being I've got to do a lot of prep for my uh, Billy Corbin interview. Billy Corbin, of course, is the director of Cocaine Cowboys. Uh, he makes amazing documentaries, basically. Cocaine Cowboys 1 and 2, which are on YouTube now, weirdly, but they're amazing. And uh, and a documentary called Dogfight, which is about bare knuckle boxing in uh, Florida, in Florida suburbs. Go, Ellie. Um, just in case uh, the listeners of this particular show don't know about your other show, um, Ethan does another podcast called Questionable. And recently, I watched a documentary um, in which uh, Ethan had already done a podcast with the guy that created the documentary, which was Alex Winter. Who was in... Was it Bill and Ted? He was... Uh, Bill and Ted. Bill. Well. In Bill and Ted. Bill. Oh, the dark web. I highly, highly, highly recommend you, A, listen to the podcast, and then, B, uh, actually watch the dark web uh, documentary. Because it is why did you suddenly... Why did you bother seeing that in the first place? Why did you fancy watching that? I'm I'm shot. So uh, we watched it. And Does he know who Alex Winter is then? Yeah, he knew. Oh. Nice. Well done, the gays. Um, honestly, such such a good documentary. It's really really interesting. Uh, all about basically the war on drugs and what this poor young kid tried to do, and he's now well. I won't say what's going on now because I'll ruin it. But fucking hell. Well, the story's about is this guy wrongfully accused of being this like evil murdering drug dealing dealing computer hacker. Dude. Basically. Shit they planted on that kid. Unreal. Actually unreal. Yeah. Fudge fudge the system. Yeah, find us on uh, Twitter at 2 Minute Terminator. Find her on the Facebook page, 2 Minute Terminator. I've just added another 100 amazing rare images from the Terminator films. They keep on coming, folks. I think it is now the number one place to get all your Terminator image information. It really is. The library of pictures on that page now is phenomenal. So, yeah, we'll return tomorrow, I think. Yes, we will. Uh, find us on Twitter. Please support the show. Tell your friends. Well, if you're coming down here, maybe we can uh, do a couple of ones with you actually here and I'll just put them out early week and that will cover us until Tuesday. You'll get Billy Corbin's Cocaine Cowboys. uh, You'll get Billy Corbin's Cocaine Cowboys uh, interview on the Wednesday and then we'll be back and uh, back and uh, back to our normal routine. I do. That's why I need to get this show out on Wednesday and then work on Thursday. Well, the idea would have been to kind of get this show up and up, basically, and get all of them done at the weekend. Just knock them out throughout the week. Knock them out. Anyway, thank you so much for tuning in. Thank you. I've been Ellie Fitzgerald. Hitting does musician. Peak.
man, you and me, we're fucking done professionally. Fucking ass.